we're still trying to get this thing working. Um, the, for some reason, we got power cut off here. And I don't even know how this thing is working here. If we got power cut off, how's this thing working? Battery. Hey? Is that running off a battery? Okay. All right. Okay, we we got an issue right now. Yeah, so anyway, let, let's 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 keep going, okay? Um, let, let's follow on from what um, what Isabel was just talking about, and what we what we were just talking about, and what Dennis has introduced, because it is a discussion that we need to <coughs> we need to pursue. Now, the position that we're at, as the presentation that I have um, to present to you, is to show the legal foundations for all of our arguments. Yeah, and the situation that we have right now is that. Believe it or not, we are in charge. We are in charge. But we don't at present have the capacity to exercise the power that we have. And the reason we are not able to exercise the power that we have is simply because we don't have the numbers, we don't have the number of educated people who understand it all in those communities because we need to educate our people in the communities. The second thing is they don't know what their rights are. They've been denied any knowledge of what their rights are in terms of their rights as a human being, in terms of their rights that have been established in the United Nations. A lot of people argue with me and say that, um, why do you go to the United Nations? Because that is the power seat of the colonizers, and quite correctly so. If you look at the United Nations, the United Nations is full of countries that are, are formerly colonies of England. And so England has the power within the colonies and they, and they also have the power in the United Nations. Now, part of the problem though is that all those countries that were former British colonies are black. Nearly all of them are black. And all of those countries have had to fight a civil war to get their independence. And they lost thousands of people. Thousands of lives, bloodshed. And, and you see, one of the principles of the United Nations is that they don't get involved until bloodshed occurs. Now that's a crazy ideological factor that I think you know, is just absurd. But that's the reality of the United Nations. They don't get involved until bloodshed. But on the other hand, since we, we started in 2012, I notified the United Nations through the UN, there is a process. And through the Sovereign Union, we identified to the United Nations that we were going down the road of exercising our right of freedom and our right of self-determination. And that we were going down the right to begin to assert our, our inherent sovereign rights. And I identified to the Secretary General, in writing, that we anticipated that the Australian Government would use its police and its military forces against us. To prevent, no, us, not the AFP. To, to prevent us from exercising the authority that we have over ourselves and our lands. Well, that's now, not true the, reason, the, 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 the reason I did that is because the United Nations will not get involved if they've not been forewarned. That's their protocol. And so we forewarned them that in us exercising our authority as a people on our own lands, to obtain our and, and assert our sovereign independence, that those police and the military may be used against us. Now, what we have then is that we have a very strong argument now to say that any action that is brought against us, um, the United Nations are fully on alert. Now, just to prove exactly what's going on here, <clears throat> if you look at um, from 19, 1999 right through to 2002, 2000, sorry, 2004, in attending the United Nations, I presented a whole series of documents and articles about Australia's violation of all the human rights. And so I built this great catalogue of arguments within the United Nations. And being there in those forums, it made it possible for me to present. Not only that, we also submitted things to other um, UN bodies outside of the human rights um, um, arena. 
And we push that so that we make sure that people are fully aware of what's going on in this country. So this dossier is there. I've also briefed completely dossier of all the things that have gone wrong in this country to every member of the United Nations, every member state. In 2011, when Australia presented its report to the United Nations on all the things that are still in here, in terms of human rights, the most interesting thing that occurred was the fact that 130 nations actually condemned Australia at their presentation in 2011. 130 of the United Nations condemned Australia. I have a document from the 2011 presentation and an argument when Australia put their argument up. The United Nations then concluded that you have to initiate action within your country and address these issues. And the United Nations gave them a five-page document of all the things that Australia had to do in addressing issues in this country. And of course, one and a half pages relates to Aboriginal people. Did you give those documents to the QC? No, I gave them to the United Nations. And so what, what happened was that the United Nations then came back. No, my documents I gave. No, no. And part, part, of the, part of the United Nations res, uh, response to Australia and recommendations was, and if you look at what's going on now currently that Australia is talking about, they're now being forced to take action. One of which, which is quite strange, one of which is that Australia has to address the relationship, its relationship. Now, Australia is very smart when they put down their response to this. What they didn't put down in the document is that the United Nations said that Australia has to develop a, a formal relationship with its indigenous population. But when they look at it, it talks about relationship, right? Yeah. Engaging in relationship. And that's what's on the public record. Not about the relationship with Aboriginal people. So, when we talk about this recognised campaign, this is about this relationship agenda that Australia has been, that the United Nations, in the United Nations, all the countries have said, you have to begin a process. Now, aside from that, in 2013, uh, 2015, Australia was then listed on the uh, decolonisation list. So Australia is now listed formally on the list to countries that has to be decolonised. Yeah? Now, we come back to the, the relationship agenda. When you get back to that relationship agenda, this is what this referendum proposal is all about. This is what they're talking about. This recognised Aborigines. Right. But recognise is very dangerous. Well, we've got a speaker to talk about that later on. Um, because it's very important for people to understand what that recognise truly means. On the other side, <coughs> you have... Um, just, to, just to tell you how Australia is, is lying and are very deceitful, and don't tell the Australian public what's going on, the agenda that they have, that they're running in terms of... Um, what do they call it? Um, um, gay and lesbian relationship, the United Nations told Australia they have to deal with that. That was 2011. So they're just starting to bring that agenda in because Australia has an obligation under international law to start dealing with it. The second thing, Australia was also demanded because of the number of complaints about domestic violence in this country yeah, and the number of people going to jail, the number of people getting killed, as a result of this, the United Nations also told Australia that you have an obligation to address these social issues that you have to deal with. So all of these agenda items that you see the government starting to roll out now are all demands by the United Nations. When you look at our position, Australia has got no answers, even though they're saying they're trying to address them. And, um, and I think that what we need to do, um, so we get on top of these things, is that we as a people have to understand what our rights are. Because right now, a lot of our people are sitting out there and wanting to fight, but they don't know exactly what it is that they're fighting, how they're fighting. They, got, they, have, they don't fully understand it in our community. So I've got young people right now in 
northern New South Wales, amongst my mob. There's a total of about 350 of these young people between the age of 16 to 35. Yeah, 45, sorry, 45. That's the age group. And these 350 men, that's not to mention the 200 women that are standing there, they're saying, what do you want us to do? So they're ready. They're arming themselves. But they can't literally take on the agenda of, 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 um, of approaching, asserting our sovereign inherent rights until they get to fully understand what those rights are. Now, um, later, when I go through the presentation, when they get this thing operational, I will present that foundation that Richard just said, this is something we need to talk about. And so I think we all need to get to understand uh, where things, where we're going to, where we're at, and where, we, where we're going to get, get ourselves to. We're a small number of people, 3% of the population, 3.5% of the population. But you see, we are 3% of the population, but we are 100% correct. And so there are other things that we, you need to understand here in this meeting. You need to understand the significance, uh, and I'll change now to something different, but it works within this realm. People, when you're travelling around this country, take a look at the Aboriginal Torres Strait Island flag. Have a look where it's flying. Please. Think about the flag. You see, not enough of us understand what the white man's, how the white man's common law system started. Now, I've been back and forth to England for a long, lot of, many years, going in to try and find out all the little secrets. There's only one place I haven't been to yet, and that's under the dungeons in the bottom of the basement of the city of London. But I found, but I found one little church that sits right in front of the High Court of London that are uh, very difficult to get into. But there's, under there is a treasure trove of the secrets of how the Crown maintains its power. We, in this country, Aboriginal people, we can and we have the ability to dismantle that power. Yeah? We can. And this is the thing that they are very worried about in this country. Because you see, everything that Australia's done to this day, from colonisation right through to now, every, uh, what do they call them, governor, who's been appointed with a commission to Australia, has acted in a treasonous manner against the rules of England. They've acted, and, they've been, and the action that they've done was treason. They act committed treason against their crown in England and about all instructions. Let me just give you one example. Uh, I came across a document by a former, I didn't know, I did not know that this fellow used to be a Prime Minister under Queen Victoria, right? But he wrote a book. And um, his name was A.C. Melbourne, A.C.V. Melbourne. His book was published in 1939. And in this book, he did an analysis, a complete analysis, of Australia and all the wrongs that were done in this country. All the wrongs. In this book, is that thing ready? No. In, in this book, I, I've got it because it's now my new Bible. In this book he shows all the correspondence between the colonial secretaries in England and the governors in this country. One thing he shows in that book is when Governor Macquarie was here, the problem they had was that Governor Macquarie began to make proclamations and declarations which caused massacres in this country, legalised the killing of Aboriginal people. When Macquarie did that, Macquarie, before his term of office was ending, he actually went he actually wrote a letter to England asking the Parliament of England to indemnify him against all the wrongdoings that he committed in this country 
against uh, under his under his term of office as the governor in council in this country because he went beyond the terms of reference. And one of the things that one of the key things, two things that he did. One, he did not have the right to free and exempt former former prisoners and give them land. He had no right to do that under his commission. Second thing he did was that he made proclamations giving people the right to kill Aborigines and he committed treason against the Crown's instructions to live in amity with us. And so he committed treason and he could be prosecuted for it. And so he indemnified, he asked to be indemnified against all the actions that he did in this country as governor before he went back to England. He went back to England, nobody prosecuted him and they finally, they finally gave him his indemnification on his deathbed. You know. So they waited for someone to prosecute, but like now, we don't know our rights. So we couldn't go after these people, but we can now. We can. There is no law and no time frame for murder. So what we do is we have to begin to use these accounts of murder and murder is very important for us. Jane Morrison, the lady in the front there, Jane, can you put your hand up please? This lady has just finalised the documentation of, uh, of massacre sites in this country. Not it's not final, but anyway, you've done a very good job. You've done a very good job. If you look at the massacre sites around this country, it's hundreds and hundreds bordering on fire of sites where they killed our people. Now, you see, one of the international, one aspect of international law, which we don't know about, and which we haven't yet played the card, you cannot benefit from, the, from crime. You cannot benefit from the proceeds of a crime. You see, and because we don't have enough black lawyers who are in our struggle with us, they're not articulating this. They're not saying to us that these white fathers, they're benefiting from a proceed of a crime. The other proceed of a crime is right now. They are in fact, like in Western Australia, it's a clear example in New South Wales just now, in the last three weeks. In Western Australia they changed their heritage law and they've deregistered Aboriginal sites to allow for them to be destroyed. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. Um, so, now, in Western Australia, they've deregistered sites so that the mining companies can destroy them. <coughs> in New South Wales, they just passed a law last week in New South Wales called the Biodiversity Law. And what they're doing is giving all them white farmers out west the right to just clear the land willy-nilly. Yeah? And then they're, they're saying that, oh, we, 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 we've, we've made an arrangement so that um, if they don't make enough money, they can come and get millions of dollars of us and plant trees again and then bring all the native animals that they destroy and we can rewild the country again. You know, so this is the nonsense of this governance that's, that's currently happening. So there are a lot of things that we need to talk about. Richard's right. Yeah. We can sit here and go through a Whitefellas presentation and a regime of a conference presentation, but I think we need to get down to the nitty gritty of really talking about how do we do this? How do we use the knowledge that we have to make this work for all of us? And that's why this is called a sovereign union, because we have to get the knowledge and get it out amongst our people teach our people how to make this work. And, um, and we, we've got a big challenge on our hand, people. A very big challenge. But we have to know that we can block all their attempts against us in their legal system. We can. And people keep saying to me, why do you talk about the white man's court because the white man's court is their court? That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. However, you see, when Mabo made that decision, white lawyers never ever told Aboriginal people that our law now sits superior to their law. Our law. 
is superior to the white man's law. And in this presentation, I will show you how our law is superior and how we can use it in every aspect of our survival and our fight. So let's break for a cup of tea. Dennis has busted the tea. Can I read that? No, 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 no. When I make my presentation, then you show how it works. Right. Thank you. Let's have a cup of tea for about right. 10 minutes, please, and then we come back and we get into it. I hope we got electricity. We had electricity. Aye. What happened? It trips. They're, they're going to test the equipment because something's tripping it.